Good evening, everybody. I have six o'clock. I will call the Board of Selectmen August 8th, 2022 meeting to order. Uh, just a reminder that we are being recorded by 1623 Studios. So anybody that is joining us this evening will be recorded. If there's anybody that's been asked to speak or acknowledged by the chair, I'm gonna have you step up to the microphone at the podium so that we can hear, so that the audience um, in virtual world as well as here in the room can hear us. Thank you so much. I'm gonna invite Chief Francis to discuss one of our agenda items. We had a request from a resident to talk about the speed limit on Southern Ave. Chief, if you could give us a little bit of information there. Yeah, right down there, um, just prior to the gas shack going towards um, Manchester, where John's farm stand is, there's been some issues down there with, with speeders and what have you. And uh, I believe it was last week or the week before, there was, a, there was an accident out of, down there where a gentleman was coming out of there and a vehicle was coming over the hill and when the gentleman came out the, the vehicle coming down over the hill had hit him i went down there today and i've gone down there a few different times and i can see his concern with the speed there um he's got his business there people are having a difficult time getting in and getting out to his business residents across the street i've talked to one or two of the residents across the street they're concerned they have young children there and what's happening is it's more about when they come from Essex down over the hill towards Manchester where you're getting, you're getting them to really start to speed. So is it a visibility issue? There's a little, there's some visibility problems coming out of his, his farm stand, yes. And the speed at that? Um, the speed coming, coming down from there, it, when, when you come up as far as DeSoto Road going out of town, it hits 35 miles an hour. So that's 35 miles an hour until around the bend near Both Ways Farms. And then coming back from Manchester, it turns to 30 just beyond the gas shack. So the, the incident, do you think it, is there any sense whether it was speeding or just From what I'm, I, I was not told by the officers that it, speed was a problem with that accident. I was told that, that the gentleman actually had been cited for a failure to yield, but the concern is coming out of there. When vehicles are coming down over that hill, it is very difficult. This is true. I mean, and, and like I had said to Mr. Kasoulis today, uh, you know, it, it still means that we have to be able to be there and enforce it. So, and, you know, we can't be there all the time, there, obviously. There's, there's some sense of sure. In, in a, in a yeah, I mean, there, are, there is a tendency for people to, if the speed limit's 30, to go 35 or 40. So, I, you know, I would say if it's 25, they might go 30 or 35. Where would you put the, uh, the new speed limit if you were? Would you? Put it where the 35 is, or would you move it closer to his property? I would probably move it closer to his property, and I would, yes. Yeah. Okay. I believe this is Mr. Kasoulis yeah. now. Hey, John. Hi. We're talking about your. Oh, you don't know Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I, I also, um, so I am familiar with Southern Ave, obviously. I think that the speed, the, the rate of speed on the road in general has been problematic. I know yeah. that the police officers have done a lot of traffic enforcement there. They do right. a lot of selective enforcement there. Um, I'm very much in favor of, like you said, when the speed limit's 25, they're gonna push their lock and go 30 to 35. So I think right. bringing it down gives us a different threshold. So um, I mm -hmm. know that you were unable to get a speed study in, but yeah. I certainly, um, I know that you'll do that. We will do that, yes. And I know that you are, more than capable of, of disseminating those results and yes. making sure that it's appropriate. So, and in addition, we would have to have the state agree to change the, the speed change. regulations, right? Because towns filed speed regulations on all municipal streets in the 50s and 60s, and they still are sitting there today. And Brilliant. so, that's an additional step. So, Chief, would the 35, where would you put it back up to 35, like down by Apple Street, probably after Apple Street? I would say that would be the best bet because it's still a winding road, you know. So it would be like what, maybe a quarter or a half mile of 25 extension? Yeah. But so Apple to the current yeah, the 40 the mile is like a hundred, couple hundred yards, right? Just I don't beyond know where the 40 is. I believe it starts just beyond King's Court. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. maybe just leave it then, 25 to there. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that would be obviously up to. The question I would have. The recommendation was 25 to Apple Street, right? Which 
I Hicks Court is just a little, it's bit, just a little bit further than yeah. Apple Street. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would not go 25, but, uh, 35, no, 40. No, I mean, just great. 25, 40. Yeah. yeah, that would make no sense to right. to put a 25 to Apple and then change it at King's Court. So should I, while the chief works on a study, shall I inquire with the state? DOT, yes, sure. that would be great. Sure. So. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes. Brendan, would the state want to do a traffic study? They might have to. Let's that's hope they wondering. don't. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want that. We know what that's going to I just didn't know if that they, this is something they would normally do. It's because we're asking them to change. The yeah, because it comes from one of the general laws that we have to have speed regulations on file with the DOT. Right. And so their interest is if you want to change those regulations, you have to go through the DOT to do it. Right. I don't know. I'll, I will just simply ask, we're looking at changing it. Yeah. What do we need to do? And then see what they say. Just remember that the whole point of this is that people speed on Southern Ave. And when a speed study is done, they take, is it the 85th percentile of the average speed? I believe it is. So if they take the 85th percentile of the average speed, it has to stack. It's okay. Um, we could end up with a speed limit that's less preferable than what we have right now. So I just, we, if we can keep them from doing a speed study and we can do our right, own, it, it might be. Yeah. It could go higher. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do that. Because, yeah, I don't see what their interest is. So well, just because it's being asked and looked at, but it's not our right? Yeah, it's a, it's a rather archaic law, but yeah. we've been assured by them that those things are still on file and they still need to be consulted to do it properly. So I will entertain a motion to change the speed limit on Southern Ave in the area discussed to 25 miles an hour after the chief of police has done his speed study and provided that the DOT um, allows for the speed regulations to be changed that were filed, with the, filed back in the 1950s or 60s. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Chief Francis. Thank you. Uh, can I attend something? Yes, please, Mr. Kasulas. I am the fellow who owns the, uh, the farm stand. I'm also on the horse farm. Can you speak right into the microphone? Oh, Thank I'm you. not used to this. <laughs> uh, what did you say, Peter? I said neither are we. Okay. Uh, I own the farm stand. I also own the horse farm. One of the big problems that I have, especially when they come down the hill, I know it's an automatic thing to pick up speed. But the thing is today, nobody watches the speed limit, nobody watches what they're doing. When they're driving, I watch people. If I'm not busy, I watch people when they go by. They're texting, they're on the phone, you know what I mean? And I have horse people, they want to go out to a horse show and they want to uh, go out People come down and they slam the brakes for almost trying to hit the horse farm, okay? Last year, I had a little Pomerania dog. I got away from me, and the dog went up to the, uh, almost to the white line, okay? I reached down to grab the leash. I looked up, I didn't see a car. The next thing I noticed, a car came, killed my dog, and the person didn't even stop, okay? And this is I hear all day long. I have my grandchildren coming over. I am scared stiff, something's going to happen. The neighbors across the street, they have little children themselves. And down the street, everybody that comes into my farm stand will bring up the subject. The other day, it was last week, it was about a week and a half ago, it was a bad accident in front of the farm stand, okay? And the fireman is standing in front of my house that will be 300 feet away from the accident, all right? Woman comes down and sees the fireman with the uniform from the whole night. She almost ran him over. That was my husband. Yes. <laughs> that was I, your husband? That was my husband. It was okay. a pretty so, bad story. So, so I'm well aware. Ms. Kasulis, right. thank you so much. And I'm sorry for your loss. I think that the board sympathizes with that. And the chief of police has, he has limited resources. He has two full-time staff members, and he has them on every inch of town that he can. But we are doing our best to enforce speeds and hands-free violations. And I, he hears the concerns from all of our residents and from the board. No, I, I understand the police is doing the job. But the question is right now, I w I've noticed two things. When the police is there, somebody else is coming. What they're doing is they flash each other and let them know the policeman down the street. You are aware of that, right? And they're flashing each other. Yeah, I, I, they flash each other. Now, I'm a driver myself, so all of you are here. 
when the speed limit is 35 miles an hour, nobody goes 35 miles an hour. They're going to go 10 miles over. Right. Last year, we are sitting there across the street from me. I was talking with Mr. a Mr. do you realize the board is in favor of changing well, it to 25? That? They said that before you spoke. No, no, uh, listen, 25 is a... Is a right. What I'm trying to say is I don't think you need to say anymore because they agree with your position. Oh, oh, oh. Okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. That's we it? Use, we uh, have a uh, 610 appointment, so I'm going to have to stop you, but I appreciate you speaking tonight. We do appreciate it, and we hear your concerns. Th thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. You have a great night. Thank you for your time. So it is 610, and we do have an appointment with um, Alan McCoy, John Schmoller, Dan Fiello, and Georgianne Richards to discuss placement of the memorial plaque at the Field of Dreams and review the events. So, Mr. McCoy, as you heard, we're being recorded, and we do need to speak into the microphone for people sure. to be able to hear us. Sure. Um, bear with me one moment. So the board will recall that back on February 28th of 2022, we voted unanimously to change the name of the Field of Dreams to the Michael Mookie Phillips Memorial Field. And Mr. McCoy and John Schmoller were going to be returning to um, request the board's approval for the design of the plaque and the placement of the plaque. So we, in, in the funding was by outside donations. So we did receive um, a mock-up of some, a recommendation for the placement, but we have not seen the plaque as of yet. So did you want to give us a little bit more information and possibly share the design of the plaque? Uh, sure, sure. And Dan Fiala is here on behalf of this as well. Um, I did send to Brendan a, a, a bronze plaque just to show the, the, the style of it. Okay, uh, we're waiting for Mount Pleasant to give us the, the actual rendering that still uh, hasn't we requested it three weeks ago, haven't received it yet, so we're a little bit behind on that, but it's a, the idea is a 14 by 10 bronze plaque mounted on a granite post. Raised lettering? Pardon? Raised lettering, yep. Uh, uh, the standard bronze plaque. Standard bronze plaque. Uh, Dan had uh, uh, researched this uh, that they used in Gloucester and various fields over there, so... Uh, that's the idea. It's nothing, uh, you know, out of the ordinary. 14 by 10 on a on a granite post. Danny has gotten, if I'm correct, the the post donated. Uh, I met with Mike Galley and uh, we looked at several locations out there. He seemed fine with it and thought that he might be able to help with the uh, digging uh, for the post. I sent along uh, some pictures uh, that I took with. Uh, potential locations for you to examine uh, uh, so that we can do that. Now, the idea is to, is to do this in September, uh, and even if the plaque is not here in time, which I'm starting to feel like is becoming, uh, uh, based on how long it's taken Mount Pleasant to even get us a rendering, I think we would just still go ahead with the ceremony and just, you know, and put the plaque in when it comes. So. So I have a couple of questions. Sure. Um, that's, that's all fine. And I did receive the email, and we do have the rendering, so thank you for sending those. Um, when we've seen plaques done in the past in the town, we usually see a plaque. We had one for the Folsom Pavilion, and it was just a bronze plaque that was mounted on the side of the building. We have them around town and in other areas. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, in my mind, I was expecting to see a plaque that would be maybe mounted on the fence behind the backstop or on the snack shack or something. I was not expecting to see a granite post. Um, one of my concerns about the granite post is that we're now putting a post in the middle of an area that at some point may potentially be renovated and we're gonna work around it. Is it gonna fit into the, to the future development of that field? Should we develop it? It doesn't mean we're gonna change the name, but I'm wondering if there was ever a consideration for what's happened in a lot of our other areas, which is to put the plaque on a rock. So you've seen it at Both Ways Farms, you've seen it at Memorial Park, and the nice thing about that, I mean, I'm looking at a rock here that's just behind your, behind your granite post that could honestly house that plaque and be bolted to that, and then the rock could be moved if that ever needed to happen. So I'm curious if there were other considerations other than the granite post we're discussing. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Dan, you have to come up. Thank you. Yes, my concern is that it could get damaged. Um, you know, people park in all kinds of crazy sure. places there and just get knocked over, like, in, you know, within a month of putting it up there. And that, because it's so exposed, you know, even if it was on a pedestal, that it be, 
embedded in the trees somewhere or something like that, if that was the only choice. I, I, you know, can I just say a word before? Okay, my, my feeling, the thinking was that we'd like this to be visible uh, so people can see it. Uh, we thought out closer to the road would make that uh, more prominent. I understand your concerns about potential damage or vandalism. These are the same concerns they had when we did the fields up there in the first place, and they never really came to pass. So I'd, I'd hate to make a decision based on what what might happen. I'd rather assume goodwill and move forward on, the, on that basis. Um, obviously, your decision, but uh, uh, you know, I thought it makes a better showing than something that's uh, uh, hung on a backstop or a shed that's really not in very good shape. That just didn't seem like that was really a, an appropriate place for it, given the condition of that shed out there. Danny? Yeah, just a, few, just a few things. Uh, obviously, we work for the city of Gloucester. We see these things all over Gloucester. Um, we have to mow around them. We have to do snow removal around them at times. Um, I think one of the challenges is with a rock, uh, unless it's a very flat face for that 10-inch by 14-inch space, it, it really doesn't get mounted that securely. So the, the posts that I have looked at would be a flat granite, um, I'd say probably 16 to 18 wide to accommodate the width of the plaque, um, and then maybe six foot above ground, four foot in the ground, so it would be a 10 foot overall. Um, we don't have to concrete it, we can put crushed stone, so if it ever had to be moved, it would just be a matter of plucking it, so it wouldn't be something that would get damaged if we ever had to accommodate something as far as moving it. Yeah, I don't, I don't mind it being on a pedestal, it, it just should be in the right place. I'm not, you know, I don't recall that area as well, but you know, there's some stands along there. Sometimes there's the opening into the into the field itself. I don't know whether that's a good place for it or not, because then it's just kids going by there. But that might be important as well. well these these are three different the, options. I know that. I know that. Or to me, to me, the option that I think makes a little bit more sense is is this one or the, along the road. Between the Along road, the road coming in, yeah. yeah. The left field fence or the third base mm -hmm. fence. Yeah. I like that one too. And it's protected somewhat there. Yeah, I and mean, people don't park there. Well, they do. <laughs> yeah, they, they The they post will prevent there. them from parking yeah. where the post yeah, goes. Well, yeah, they do park there. So I, and I'm not an arborist, but I'm just curious if we've had any consideration for the roots of these mature trees. Do we know if we're going to be disrupting the... Um, the root growth by digging that in such close proximity to such a mature tree. I'm sure we could, if we drew a circle, we could probably find a friendly spot that would not disturb the root. So if we had to shift it, um, if we were given a window of, of where, so if we hit roots, I'm just volunteering my services for digging. If Mike can't get to it, I'm not saying I'm gonna be the one digging the hole, but. Um, doing that with a shovel? Yes, and calling dig safe. Not the place to put it. Perfect. Right. It's, it's Right in the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't like idea one? That that one. Can I come take a look at that one? one? Sure. Idea one? This one. Is that right off the parking lot? Yeah, yeah. Right the parking lot. Yeah. This is the one that, and the other yeah. nice thing is, this is one on the left field. You see it? Yeah. Right on third base. Yeah. Yeah. Coming in. You see it? Yeah. Have a nice sight. Yeah. And, and it's shady. And it's very visible to people coming in uh, as opposed to something that's in the ground that, uh, like I saw the, uh, the heath plaque is having, having kind of disappeared. Relocate my inbound water pipe around a 200 year old maple tree. I, they, they can, they, they can. No, I know that they can get through the roots. I just want to make sure we're not then dealing with a dead tree on the edge of the road. So, Alan, I guess my question if both gentlemen like that location. What does it look like further up on the same third baseline, but on the op just beyond this sign that says, uh, I think it says residents only on the sign. What does it look like up here? Are there any more mature? I'm just wondering if there's any more mature trees or are they all cut down? I'm seeing stumps here. You mean further out? Yeah, not too much further, but we see where those dead stumps are? If you were to move it, slightly beyond that sign, you wouldn't be hitting roots. Right. But I would need to go look at the area. I think if you gave us a circle of 
put it in an overall the circle and it's and it's a 10 by 10 circle or or whatever then we could find a spot is outside the drip edge is safe i think we're talking about uh you know a, a post hole uh yeah. size hole so it's just not something I'm where not we're disturbing sure lots of roots that, right that even the hole would impact the roots mm -hmm. significantly because you're talking about like two percent of the root area you know even though he's going six feet down you're yeah fine i don't i don't see that being a you know if you're right next to the tree that's one thing but mm -hmm. if you're you know halfway out to the drift edge or something like that yeah so your boat it sounds like yeah i don't, I don't mind that location it sounds like you're both in favor of the granite post yeah i'm, yeah, I'm you, fine with it yep and you both like this location somewhere along there you know so make it work try not to impact the trees sure well well. And I want to make sure that we're all in agreement that this needs to stay relatively far off the road. I don't need, sure. I don't want the plow trucks to be, are, you know, complaining that they are plowing yeah. in the wintertime and they're not able to get the snow off the road. I mean, it's, it's set back. I can't tell from this drawing, but I would think we need it at least four feet plus yeah. back. As, as a plow guy, I'll put it in the right spot. Perfect. Far enough. They do. They just don't yeah, salt. They, they don't go all the way up. Yeah. Past the upper so, lot. Yeah. Thank God. So I will. I guess the only other question is we haven't seen the plaque, the the mock up of the plaque. So should we table this until we see the plaque to make a final vote? I mean, if that's the board's pleasure, that, that's what up does to it you. say? It says exactly the wording that was in the approved uh, Michael Mookie Phillips Memorial Field. That's it. That's it. It does it have dates? We don't need to see I don't, it. I don't think it had dates on it. Like, what, an inch and a half? Yeah. Letters, whatever. 14 yeah. by 10. Yeah. yeah. Granite post. Yeah. I don't okay. think we need to see it. Really. All right. Uh, I'll send you a... Uh, dedication date? Well, uh, to, be, to be determined, we're going to have a celebration in September. Lana, uh, is, is, she's up from Florida, so we're going to try to do it in September. And as I said, even if the plaque's not here, we're going to go ahead and I'll schedule a, uh, you know, a very small... Would you have a dedication date or would you have a, his birthday? Oh, you mean on the plaque itself? Yeah, oh, I, plaque don't or not. I, I don't think we would have just the name, just the the name and the yeah. memorial field. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, I, I thought you were asking about no, no, when we were no. going to do the dedication. Yeah. I will entertain a motion to approve the plaque as we receive the rendering via email and for the placement of the granite post on the third baseline. Should we circle back to Brendan with uh, the proposed location? Yeah, just yeah. just yeah, to make sure. Location, yeah, yeah. go out and look at it and yeah. see something that makes yeah. Those more are, sense than exactly where that one is. Yeah. We can do a diagram. With a couple, we'll just just put a, a stake holes. in the ground put a and take and we'll a picture out. of the whole area. I'm just no, going by four, no four, four, four feet, feet above. Usually, what you do is usually what we do you do you do fifty percent, so you'd have four feet up and four feet down. So, um, sorry. Yeah, they don't want kids to see it or short adults. <laughs> I was mid motion, but sorry, I, f I completely so forgot. Moved. So. But, well, I want to make sure we have a location that's appropriate. So sufficiently placed away from the roots and far enough from the street that plowing will not be impeded. Terrific. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So now while these guys are still here in a related matter, and this is something that can come up at the next meeting or a couple meetings from now, um, Bill Bradford has an old fiberglass flagpole that used to be down the ballpark here. And he's asking to put that also at the Field of Dreams. Um, first, I just wanted to ask you, I mean, you wouldn't see that that would detract, right? It would, How tall? He didn't, he didn't say. It, it used to be it. down there. I don't remember. It's shorter than the one that's at the memorial now. Oh. Um, the thing about it is, unless it's lit at night, I don't know who's going to go out and put a flag up and take it down, because that's what you're supposed to do. You can do a solar light, solar up light. Yeah, they'd have coverage. to do yeah, something that's what like we do that. With Gloucester, yeah. Just for a so is that something? Is that something I should ask him to come up with suggestions, just like these folks have done for a future meeting? Well, I think we need to know where the placement's going to be. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, mean, we, I, I just don't want to see all of our 
town spaces cluttered with Well, this is my question. Health. Shall I tell him that you have no interest in putting that on an agenda, or do you want to hear him with suggestions? Do they do, um, at these ball games, do they do the national anthem? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Maybe on, maybe on opening some, day. Some but, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. So it's not like people are all facing the flag and, that, and they do that. You know? I think we'd need more information. I think we would need to know location, um, who's going to raise and lower the flag if they're doing the national anthem, who's going to maintain it, who's going to dig the hole, who's going to cement it in, is this going to be done on a donation basis, volunteer, what's the expectation? So I guess I would want more information before we entertained this. Yep. So maybe I'll have that for the board at your first meeting in September. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And... Habermaster Fiello, you are my next appointment at 6.20, so if you'd like to stay where you are. So as the board will recall, we worked on a work plan. So we have a standard work plan and operating procedures for the Essex Habermaster in this assistance as assigned. So Dan and I met a couple of weeks ago, um, and we reviewed the work plan. He had made some suggestions and kind of talk to me about a couple of different areas of concern, which I highlighted, I'm assuming Dan has, and I I informed him that meeting with me is great, and we talked through a few things. I still had some concerns about a couple of things, but I said, you know, it really needs to come back to the full board for an entire discussion and talk about what our expectations are. So if you guys have the work plan, Dan, I'm going to let you... I have it on my phone, so... Okay, Uh, we'll go slow. That's fine. So if you want to start, I think your first one... I don't think the board members have copies of it. I have it, and Dan, if you want to just talk about which ones, and if we want to quickly read them, I can do you Do, do you want to start just so that I, I have um, the unmarked in my phone copy? Oh, okay. So if you want to just start with. So the first question Dan had for me was under um, 1A, uh, double I, for the above equipment, a complete spring and fall checklist to ensure that all major systems and accessories are in good working order and arranged for repairs or maintenance as necessary. Ensure that all ap- applicable equipment is thoroughly cleaned before shrink wrapping for the season and that all winterization protocols are followed per the equipment manufacturer's recommendation. So the reason for this, as I explained, was that, and Dan will enlighten us a little bit further, but I, we had a cracked cracked motor? Lower unit, lower unit, yeah, part of the lower unit, not the entire thing. Somehow water got in, yeah. So water got in and it froze over the winter and so that was one of the concerns is that we actually didn't think we were gonna get the Harbor Master boat into the river on time. But we were able, Dan and his mechanic were able to do a makeshift repair. We got it in the river, it's still holding the parts on order. But as we move forward and the boat gets older, we want to make sure that we follow proper maintenance so that we're not spending money on a new boat, which Dan is in the process of looking for grants to replace the boat, but the board doesn't want to see you know, money spent unnecessarily. So I don't think you were opposed to doing a maintenance log. Nope. You just questioned why. I think I'm, I'm going to create a checklist of things that I feel I should be doing, and obviously um, service work for the mechanic should be doing will provide us with a checklist from his, his standpoint. I think it was a fluke thing this year. It was... It hasn't happened in years past, so. So then under. Um, so then this would all be under you. This is your, all your, this is not any outside part. Uh, to, to my ability, certain stuff, but I'm going to create my own checklist of what I'm going to do, and then he'll provide us with a checklist of what he services. So typically we have the motor serviced at least once a year. We're probably going to have to start doing that twice a year just because of the age of the motor. But he'll, he has his own checklist within his computer that he can provide us with what he does and um, that he does it. So. And Dan does things like removes the radio, shrink wraps the boat, cleans the boat, shrink wraps the boat. So that will be on his checklist so that we know that the yep. radio is removed and that's not staying out during the winter months and things like that. Um, so Dan, under B, during patrols, number four, Although the harbor master has jurisdiction in the whole Essex Bay in any, in any portion of the town of Essex, a, as a general rule, the harbor master shall stay within the confines of the Essex River unless an incident in Essex Bay or Ipswich Bay requires emergency response, possibly by a call for mutual aid from the town of Ipswich or the city of Gloucester. The Essex River is the harbor master's priority during regular operations. 
And then um, the next piece, which is five, says patrol emphasis should be from the last Noake buoy through the Kanomo Point mooring field. In addition, the mooring field and area behind Choate Island shall be included as circumstances require selective enforcement in the area. The patrol area shall not be outside of the town of Essex boundaries unless it's necessary to provide mutual aid to another adjoining community or to access an Essex area through another community. Without a written mutual aid agreement and a specific request during an incident, the harbor master lacks sufficient jurisdiction to become involved in another community and must stay within the Essex patrol area. So one of the points Dan made was that we do have an MOU with Ipswich, which we do know about that MOU. Um, and that he wants to do a loop past the beach for patrolling. One of my concerns that I raised was, you know, naturally yes. past on um, the backside, back of cranes, which was one of the reasons why this ended up going into the work plan, which was that we were getting complaints that why is our Essex Harbor Master boat in Ipswich and basically patrolling Cranes Beach? It's not in Essex and it's not our jurisdiction and it's a waste of gas. So when I mentioned that during our meeting, is that with fuel being on, you know, super expensive, and it not being necessarily in Essex, maybe we should not be patrolling back there. So, where is the line there anyway? It's so, so a little bit about this point from my standpoint. Um, we have two transient moorings that are behind Hog Island. Um, I've been out on my own. Obviously, tide is a dictator of whether or not we can get out there. But um, I've been out there on my own and seen two or three boats tied up to our transient, which is only supposed to accommodate one boat. So if the tide's in our favor, um, I, I do tell the guys, you know, check on the transients. I don't want to see something happen. I don't want to see something break free. So it's not like on land we kind of have a right of way through Ipswich to get into Essex, water, Essex behind the Hog Island. Um, there's a mooring field up inside. There's about a dozen active moorings, and we have two transients that we keep an eye on. So I, I do tell the assistants if tide's in our favor. In Crane Beach, down by the boathouse. Yep. Yep. So, so we traverse through Ipswich to get up into that area. That's really the only way. I wouldn't. So the front side of Hog Island isn't really navigable for some people, so I don't encourage people to go around that way. Um, the the problem that I've had in in years past, because I think you get as many complaints as why is Essex in Ipswich, and in years past I've kind of said. You know, don't engage when you're in Ipswich until we get an MOU in place. Now we have an MOU in place. The, the flip side of the coin is that if somebody's doing something dangerous coming through that area and we're in Ipswich with a written MOU in place, um, I, I would engage and I would educate without citing, per se, um, without notifying Ipswich. Um, if it got to a citation or if I needed backup, uh, obviously notify Ipswich. But I, I'd be hard-pressed to sit on the backside of Cranes Beach with a boat blowing through, and because our boat has Essex on it, that we're not able to just at least slow the boat down. That would be the level of. How far off the backside of Cranes is the town line? As isn't it down there? Well, not the yeah, the backside of Cranes down by Hog Island. Isn't there some of Essex? Th down there's a there's a boundary, and if you look at Hog Island from Kenoma Point, yeah. it's it's basically to the right of Hog Island, so it's yeah. It's, it's a busy area. Yeah. It's become a busy area, I should say. It hasn't been a busy area. Yes. Yeah. But so Essex ends, Essex water ends at like the Dones houseboat, correct? Uh, so well, that's kind of the in the shortcut. That's so. the shortcut. Yeah, and, the, and that left side is all Essex. Right, so yep. the, that left side's Essex. Then at the Dones houseboat forward toward the back side is Ipswich. Some of it's Gloucester, actually, to the okay, right. And yeah, Gloucester, and then obviously to Kenoma Point is Essex, and yep. then we end at the last green can. The last green can. Outside of Kenoma Point, Mooring Field. Just about there, yeah. Yeah, yep. so we, we basically, okay. right, so that's Essex water. So part of this was that the, the patrol route would pretty much come down the Essex River, go right toward Kenoma Point, and then just come back. They would, yeah. other than we have a transient. you're going off to the back, to the transient moorings, you've got to cut through either Glocks or or Ipswich. Right, right, right. And it's not, it's not my encouragement to say, go to Ipswich and write tickets, go to Gloucester and write tickets, but I think it's, if I saw somebody blown by kids or anchored boats, um, we do have jurisdiction to, to cite. It's not, we're not a citation happy department, um, but at least educate and slow it down and make it a safe environment. So I think the caveat is if we don't say something and they say, well, you're 
in Ipswich, you're out of jurisdiction, which we're not, and something were to happen liability-wise, if somebody was to get hurt, I'd be curious to see how that would play out. Yeah. So. Yes. Pursuit or you want to yeah. Call it. Yeah. A, a limited, a limited ability. If it gets to the point, and and if it gets to the point of a citation, you know, Ipswich is on the radio, and I would kind of explain to them the situation, um, and I think they would say, "Go ahead and, and cite the guy." If it's if if it's gotten to the point of me calling Ipswich regarding an incident. Um, So if you read the work plan, it basically says he will stay in Essex waters. So the, the concern is that we have a harbor, ma harbor master and our assistant harbor masters that have limited time on the boat and limited time on the water. We want them, they're being paid by the town of Essex to keep the Essex water safe and patrolled. And we get a lot of complaints about throwing wakes, speeding in the river, you know, going up on the marsh, things like that. So people are saying if they were more focused in the Essex waters, we wouldn't, and they're not over in Ipswich, they're in Essex, we would catch more of those people. We would, we would be patrolling our own waters. So Dan, my question, you've had a lot of um, split shift scheduling this yep. season. You're doing an eight hour shift, but you're doing four hour windows. Yes. In a four hour window, how many times would you say that the Harbor Master boat is going past the backside? I mean, is it just one loop it's, and you're it's done? It's probably one loop based on tide because it's a challenging part of the river right now to get up inside. So, and I, and I, inform the assistants that if it's even questionable for you to access that area don't put yourself in a bad spot um, there's a few guys that could get up inside we do have a gps with a safe water track um, but at a lower tide I, I agree that our enforcement should be not within a precarious area but it's it's also based on traffic patterns um, in the morning you have the outgoing traffic so we'll hang at water street uh, down river at the beginning of kanoma to slow people down at the opposite end of Kenoma to slow people down, and then the and then the traffic becomes uh, not so much in that mooring field, but there's there's traffic around the beach. So if if Ipswich has an incident going on out front, uh, they'll call us a lot of times and say, "Hey, we got something. Where our boat's out front, can you just slide towards the backside because that's where the majority of the boating is happening." And then on the reverse of that, at four or five o'clock, people flip a switch and everybody comes inbound, which is when we're usually back at. Kenoma Point within our waters and, and keeping an eye on our waters. So. Okay. so keeping it worded, do you, does the board see any reason to change the wording in the work plan or just to have an understanding that doing one loop if the tide allows is not problematic? No, I don't think it's problematic. I think, you know, they need to do that, you know, and if we get rid of that wording, you know, they won't be able to do that. Okay. I don't disagree that the emphasis should be our river, but I do, I do think that, you know, the one pass, and if we were to engage in Ipswich, I have justification if somebody was to bring up a complaint that we were in Ipswich waters. So if it's a dangerous situation, I wouldn't hesitate to educate. Yeah, and I don't think the work plan is necessarily about um, engaging or enforcement. I think it's more the concern of making sure that the Essex Harbor Master and their assistants are monitoring our waters yep. being in the town of Essex so going doing a loop past the beach isn't the end of the world and if something happens at that time or they're looking for assistance it's no different than mutual aid we we understand that um so that's fine and then all right Dan so then under number five situations requiring off-duty involvement number b it says if the harbor master feels the official uh, that official involvement is a, in a given situation is necessary without having been officially summoned pursuant to subsection A above, in the event in question is criminal or medical in nature, he shall first clear that inclination with the police officer in charge of the shift or incident to determine such need. If the decision is made that he is needed, or if he is adamant that the situation requires the harbor master get involved, a report stating so should be filed with the board of selectmen as soon as possible. And then it goes on to further C, which says, in the event that the harbor master is needed, the call is not to be handled from a remote location via radio. The harbor master shall come into the situation or respond to the area involved or the location from which Marine One will be deployed and or returning to respond accordingly to the situation. So um, Dan had said to me that if he hears a radio transmission 
he would like to be involved. And if it's on the water, he definitely expects to be involved and not have to clear it first. So initially, the wording was changed from if he's adamant that his involvement is required, he would file a written response to the chief of police. And then it says, as is the case with the police department, if there are further questions or there is a specific need, the chief of police should be notified. That went away when it was brought from the police department under the selectmen and now says board of selectmen as soon as possible. So if you want to speak to that a little bit, Dan. Yeah, I think, I think a lot of the, the wording in here, even the stuff that's not in red, I think is kind of based on when it was a kind of co-department operating under the police chief. And I think some of the stuff that I would have to report to um, the police officer in charge, um, obviously it'd be in radio contact, but I don't think as being now a completely separate department um, some of the police officers have a, a river mind and some of them don't. So I think my knowledge of the river um, is, is kind of what dictates my desire to be involved. And everybody has a scanner and if I hear something going on and I'm, and I'm able to respond, I think it can only be beneficial to the situation. Um, again, going back to the police officers in charge, it's not always, a lot of the sergeants have, have some river familiarity. Um, some of the officers, officers don't have as much. Um, so I think I would revert back to the expertise of us, um, be it me or an assistant. I guess it's focused on me as, as in this particular case, but I, I don't think I would, I would put myself in a situation that would be detrimental to the situation. I don't, I don't think I would, I would only involve myself if it could help the outcome, um, somewhat of the lake situation last week, so. Okay, and so that was as far as... Your intent is hearing it via radio transmission. You'll put, put yourself there, even if not called to the scene. Correct, and I, I don't think it. I don't think it should be needed to be first cleared with the police officer in charge because if it's two separate departments, although I'd be in radio con. Usually they're calling me anyway to be involved, um, but I don't. I don't think that line. You know, as as the department head and the harbor master, I don't think it should need to be cleared by somebody on the land with maybe expertise or maybe not expertise. Well, I think the reason for the scan is that usually when you're getting involved, for instance, last week we had a situation where there was a 911 call made, there was a boat and the call was that there was a boat, the boat has sunk in the lake and there are people in the water. The 911 call came in, the first call that they made was to the police department and the fire department to dispatch an ambulance and a fire boat in the police department. The police were first on scene. And while en route, they called Dan. And uh, actually, regional tried calling you. And so I then called Dan and said, where are you? Because regional didn't get him. So I called him personally on a cell phone. <laughs> and um, there's, a primary, there's a primary and a secondary cell phone. They right. did get through to me on my secondary phone. Um, but so that's a situation where I think that the officer in charge is going to reach out anyway. So the police are typically involved. I, am I right in thinking that the police they, are involved? I think they'd be involved. I, just, I think the wording would be more lateral. Than, than hierarchy is. So you're thinking it should say informed by? Yeah, so no one disagrees that there shouldn't be communication. Correct, which, which there was. Even last weekend, you know, I was in contact with the officer. And, yep. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think I should have to clear my watercraft involvement as the harbor master of a seaside community. And we'll send that section to you with okay. some redlining to yep. talk about. And then under number eight, um, schedule B, areas of oversight. So the third one down says Shabaco Lake, portion within town boundaries. Coverage on the lake shall be undertaken at least six times in any boating season with the goal of providing as much coverage as manpower and budget resources will allow. So Dan had relayed that it's been very difficult to fill shifts this summer. Um, that the environmental police actually have total oversight over um, any great pond and that Shebeco Lake is actually a great pond and not a lake. So, it's a great pond. so if you want to give us more on that, Dan. Well, I, I, I just think given our manpower, if our, we have a river, um, 
Hamilton Police don't, and Hamilton Police have offered very little uh, via the waterways of Shabaco. We have the majority of the lake up there. I think it's 70-30, if not 80-20. So I don't disagree that maybe some coverage should be provided, but it's it's been kind of an ongoing problem with, uh, at one point, Hamilton wanted to share the boat, and we were kind of, that was through previous regime, and um, they didn't really feel the if you break it, you buy it type of thing. So I think that was kind of next. The environmental police, I've reached out to them, and they've really stepped up up on patrols, on jet ski, even on jet skis at one point, because people called about a jet ski, and I said, yeah, it's the environmental police, and they're responding to an incident. Um, I think you're always going to have people, if we're up the lake, people on the river are going to wonder why we're not on the river, and if we're on the river, people on the lake are going to wonder why we're not on the lake. So we don't work 24 hours a day. I don't have eight guys on one shift that I can send two up to the lake and have two on the river because it's just not within the budget. We do try to get up there a handful of times. This year has been tough. Um, we've had some sickness. We have some uh, some older guys, and um, you know, we're trying to revamp the staff to get some younger faces and some familiarity with the Shabaka Lake. But um, my my personal priority is is the river. Uh, I think you're always going to get calls from people, no matter what you do. So I think the patrol emphasis has been the river, uh, especially given the fact that the environmental police have kind of taken it up a notch on the lake and we've had some good feedback about that as well. What's the environmental police are state state. state. So how often do they patrol it regularly? They've been up there a few times a month. I mean they're they're stretched thin also, but I kinda reached out to them at the beginning of the season with my concerns and I just said, I know you guys are stretched thin, but if you get up there a handful of times make a presence, um, anything's better than what we've had. So as well? Yep. How quickly can they respond? Depends on how, who's on duty. I mean, they cover a pretty large area where they're based out of Gloucester. They cover, I think, from Amesbury or Salisbury down to here. Uh, so depending on where they are, there was, like, the lake incident. Um, Joe Gray was seven minutes out. He lives in Manchester and was actually on duty. But I don't I don't have an on-call schedule. I know they have six or eight guys out of Gloucester, but it's kind of a roll of the dice as to who's on duty. Yeah. So how many, I know that you said that you asked them to be up there a handful of times. How many times would you say they've been up there this season? I would I would say a handful already. Yeah. Yeah. I guess my concern is we still have residents, well, well Essex has a river and a lake, and residents on the lake want to see a presence. And I would hate to say we, we're going to take this out and not have a, a presence on the lake or be visible because it. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, no, we should be visible. Right. It, for some uh, response, but you know, Dan's saying that the environmental police is maybe doing more than they have in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Know, which is good, you know. I mean, that helps. You know, I mean, people are looking for some sort of support. You know, some sort of protection, and it doesn't matter whether it comes from Essex or from the state or where it comes from. Or right. Hamilton. Yeah, I, th I think the feedback I've been getting back this year is has been more positive than it has been in years past because they're happy, like Peter's saying, to see anybody up there um as far as that goes and, and the person that is i'm not going to say the complainer but calls me a lot um she's very happy that there's been a presence so and she's even come out and said it she said it doesn't have to be you guys it's just the lake's been a lot busier the past couple of years so we do try it's just we're stretched very thin with the river so yeah, so my suggestion would be and you guys chime you can jump in my suggestion is that we leave it with six times in any boating season and say to Dan that we're not out there counting, but as staffing, Up it says two. coverage on the lake shall be undertaken at least six times in any boating season. At least. With yeah. a goal of providing as much coverage as manpower and budget resources allow. So I think that the point is, if he doesn't have the resources, not financially, but if he doesn't have the manpower, At least six times, yeah. Yeah. Mandate, yeah. But what Ruth is saying, based on resources. So if he doesn't have the resources with it. It's kind of a moot point, right? Whatever. Yeah, I mean, so I think we can just leave it. Right, I, I think we just leave it. And I think that as, if we sign on more assistant harbor masters or their hours allow for more, then we say you need yeah, to have more yeah, of a presence yeah. on the lake. We have, eight, we have eight assistants right now, and I think six out of the eight were away for this past weekend. So we were already stretched pretty yeah. thin this weekend. Right. So, But you had funky tides and yep. crazy weather. But so. I'm just, there's not really a standard for them 
and as far as taking time Chibacco off and all Lake that stuff. For whatever so, reason. what's that? Nobody was on Chebacco Lake for whatever reason. No. Well, I think that there's limited breeze, so it's super hot. I, Dan, I'm wondering if you don't look at the kind of extended of forecast, and when you know that you're going to have a gray, cloudy Saturday, you send somebody up the lake, even right. if it's just for two hours, because you know that's when they water skate. Typically, that's when we've done it in right. years past. That's when they're so, on yeah. the lake is when it's a yep. little bit gray and cloudy. So instead of being on the river when we don't have as much boat traffic, send them up to the lake. So I think just even it, and I know that it's a pain to launch a boat to be out there for two hours, but it's a visibility then. Yep. So well, we're doing our best. So we'll have Brendan Redline the areas we talked about. Okay. And I mean, like I said, if it's based on manpower and budget resources, budget obviously is not an issue. But if it, I mean, the manpower resources would kind of cover that point i guess and if we don't have the manpower we don't have the we, we try so we understand that all right do you have anything else for us dan uh let me just get one more thing. that was everything we highlighted together i, I highlighted in redlined if you want my coffee um i think it was something about the meetings In the work plan? In the work plan, the, the uh, section that covers, uh, attend, so 6, 6A, 6, 6A and B, it just talks about hours um, for attendance at public meetings and payment for actual time worked. So the A is if the harbor master is required to attend a public meeting, such as a quarterly department heads meeting or a selectman's meeting requiring his presence, he shall only be officially involved with that portion of the meeting that pertains to his operations, including reasonable time waiting for a matter to be reached on an agenda, especially if no specific time is given. He may choose to listen to other portions of the public meetings as a citizen, but no chargeable hours shall result from his choice to do so. So I just want to reiterate, because I, th I think this has come up because I allegedly put in for time I don't, meetings aren't my thing so if I can be at the least amount of meetings possible and I only put in for that time I have no problem for that um, but it just goes back to the time so for instance it was the last meeting that there wasn't a time for I had an appointee um, as well as we were talking about Front Beach um, and there were no I don't think there were times for either of those so Realistically, I, I put in for meeting. the so if, if yeah, that did, if did that's anyone what, say anything about that? Uh, I don't think last meeting was an issue. No. Okay. I think it was a previous it, previous meeting. Because what you just read accommodates that type of situation. I'm just right? trying to reiterate that and just yeah. I. But if Front Beach were not discussed and uh, the appointment, and it was just the department head meeting, which was scheduled at. 7 p.m. or 7.30, yep. and it was scheduled at 7, and we were out at 7.30, yep. that would be 30 minutes. Perfect. Because you, it was scheduled at 7, we need yep. department heads there, and I said thank you to my department heads at 7.30. That would have been 30 minutes. Yep. But the last meeting where you showed up at 6 with your appointee and you were here through the discussion, you're right. paid for that whole two and a half hours. Yep. I just kind of wanted to re re yep. re-clarify that so it's not an issue in the, in the future. Um, as far as the rest of it goes... Um, I think I've, I've tried to improve my, my logs and, and provision of uh, hours worked and all that stuff um, without this being in place. I'm just trying to get into the routine of, of getting that to you guys via email and um, you know breaking down what's happening and when just to cover everybody if there is ever a question. Um, I definitely probably don't put in for every minute my phone rings about happy people calling about moorings, but um, I've, I've tried to get better with the, with the logging. And, and that's that's a personal goal of mine is, is to continue with that so I have no other questions no. All right. we'll have Brendan red light the section we discussed get okay. it to you we'll I'll look at it and then we'll um, bring it back to the board for a final approval sounds good yeah. sure You can you can drink on a boat. You can't be drunk on a boat. So I don't know if I could have the jurisdiction. I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. So they, were talking, they were talking about having rafting uh, up and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, rafting up number one, number two, drinking. Yep. But they also talked about getting permission or advising. Uh, that That's the first I've heard of it. So oh, no, do we have any regulations about that? No, we don't.
Backside of cranes, but that's what yeah. it is. Yeah. I mean, during, during COVID, the state came down with a regulation about people weren't supposed to raft up, and my instruction to the assistants was you inform people that they're not supposed to raft up. If they choose to raft up, we're not going to, especially during a pandemic, we're not going to get close enough to get airborne um, anything. So, oh yeah, I think you see it everywhere. I think if you went to Wingashik Beach on a Saturday, Sunday, and you could walk across the boats from one end of Wingashik to the other, it's okay. Thanks, Jan. Thank you, guys. Thanks. We have Wesley Burnham in the room with us. Wes, if you want to join us, so sure. Wes is the chair of the planning board. He's also the planning board representative of the Economic Development Committee, as well as the planning board representative on the Strategic Planning Committee. He joins us this evening. Um, we have an agenda item, which is to consider ideas for candidates to fill the vacancy left on the Board of Public Works by Tim O'Leary. So having said that, um, we received a email from Mr. O'Leary indicating that he would like to resign his position as a DPW commissioner. So before we move over to meeting with Mr. Burnham, I would like to entertain a motion to accept Mr. O'Leary's resignation. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So Mr. Burnham has joined us this evening to just give us a little bit of information about himself, his background, and why he thinks he would be a good fit for that position. All right, I'll try to keep it in the read and digest version. <laughs> Uh, essentially, I've, I've been here all my life. Most, most of you guys know that. We used to run the garage, snow plows, uh, repair service. We took care of DBW and the fire trucks. Ernie got the police. <clears throat> so I've been involved with that all right along. We ran at one time four snow plows under contract for the town. Wound up getting nearly drafted for Vietnam, joined the Navy instead, went through the nuclear power pro program. Uh, I was a nuclear electrician's mate for four years on, on a submarine. Came out of there, went back to work with my father, and 1985, I got hired at Seabrook. And I started up there, went through their training program, earned my senior React operator's license, get promoted up to unit shift supervisor. So I was, to use a poor analogy, uh, yeah, the hell's a guy's name with a green head? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> basically I was in charge of one of the on shift compliments when we were in the, when we were on shift. So I had, I was about 17, 18 guys working directly for the control room chemists and HP techs and electricians and mechanics. So I did that for 20 years and I transferred over and became the maintenance, the operations liaison to the maintenance department to keep them focused on what operations needed. So I did that for the last final 10 years. I qualified as a maintenance <coughs> supervisor, which is pretty rare to have the, the two I was, I was still qualified as a unit shift supervisor in operations. And since then, I retired in, in the middle of 2014 and been hanging around here doing planning boards and the rest of the stuff. So, uh, talking with, with Ruth, she brought up, I wasn't aware of Mr. O'Leary until speaking with her. And, and I've been doing the planning board for 28 and a half years. I think it's time for a new challenge. And I think, and I do understand, I mean, a lot of, a lot of my education involves pumps, valves, you know, 30 years run operating a 1,365 megawatt nuclear power plant with 1,000 pound steam. I've had a little experience in that. Yeah, certainly you understand the uh, technical aspects of yep. those types of things, as well as, you know, it's all related, sewer, water, you know, you clearly understand well, the plow and road the, the joke on the nuclear business is generally when people retire from nuclear, because they can't stand the, the rotating shifts anymore, water and sewer is next. <laughs> 
So I guess my only comment that I learned from Town Administrator Zubricki is that you would need to give up your seat on the Planning Board, the Economic Development Committee, and the Strategic Planning Committee because you can't serve on any Board or Committee or be a Town Employee and be a DPW Commissioner. I'm fully aware of that, and I'm ready. You're I'm ready. ready. Okay. I, mean, I think I've done my share. I've been, I've been elected. I'm on my sixth term since 1985. So when would that, uh, how soon does that have to happen? As soon as he accepts the position, right? I think that um, you could make the vote contingent on Mr. Burnham uh, making any resignations that he needs to um, before a certain date. And if you set that date as August 18th, it would allow him to go to one more planning board meeting. I did discuss that briefly with him today. Okay. And if you choose to allow me to serve some more, I would like that date because that way I can chair one more meeting. I can help facilitate basically turning over to, to Kim. We are in the middle of trying to hire a new admin aide, which I got a couple of things I want to clean up there and try to move that ahead. So that would give me another 10 days to uh, clean up some of the loose ends. Right, and the, the selectmen could possibly consider uh, if there are, is a candidate for Mr. Burnham's replacement on the planning board, you meet again on the 22nd, but I know, Madam Chair, you won't be here for that. Uh, but at least it would, be, it would give the option of having that on there if it, it was necessary, because he would have already, re he would have resigned as of the 18th. But they, they would still have, a, potentially could have still have a quorum, so it wouldn't affect their meeting? Yes, they have a full Right, board. I just think oh, yeah. he wants to tie no, we've, we've, we've got We've got seven active members, so when I, when I leave, we'll still have six, although yep. summertime occasionally gets a little, little squeaky to get a quorum in. The planning board? Yeah. Well, the way that works is the remaining members of the planning board post a joint meeting with the Board of Selectmen and then all of the people at the table vote in a joint vote on someone that is nominated. And anyone can, can nominate whoever that's going to be. That nomination only goes to next spring's election. So generally, when, when, over the years when we've done this, we try to look for somebody with some past experience. You don't want to bring somebody cold in for six months. All right, I mean, there's, there's a learning curve involved that most people don't realize till they get in the middle of it. So after the board decides whether or not you want to make this appointment, the board should talk about when you prefer to have this joint meeting with the planning board so we can schedule that. When would the uh, election be in the spring? Yeah, the, the normal spring election. The May elections, yeah. yeah. With all of the rest of the town so offices. Yeah. Right, so we yeah. would just be appointing somebody to fill Wes's seat yeah. until his term ended, yeah. right, and then they No, it's run. not the term. I still got one more year. Oh, it's just until elections. They've got to be... Just until the next just election. Just until elections. Right. Oh, it's not yeah. his term. Okay. But it would... They could... They that could, person would only fill the balance of his seat, wherever it is in the rotation. Okay. Okay, so if, if he only had a year left, that person is running for that seat that vacates in one year. But he has a year and a half, so they wouldn't stay on for the year and a half. They only stay well, no, until they, the election. If they get reelected, if they get reelected, they serve for that only that other year, not a new three-year right. term. So essentially, this time around, we've actually got two seats coming up normally. Yes. Okay, so those two seats will be listed as five years. Right now, if or the balance of that yeah. of that, that seat. Person, sequence right right so it doesn't get out out of uh, yeah. sequence that person could run again for it would be a one-year one-year balance on, on mine whoever could be somebody cold from the outside yep. I mean it's it's a normal election process this year there'll be two five-year terms in the one-year term if we move ahead I do you have any questions no it sounds like you have some good qualifications well I do you talk I'm looking, to those guys on the, the other, well? Well, I, I mean, I've, I used to talk with uh, uh, Scott DeWitt, still do quite a bit. Yeah. And I know Mike Galley very well. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm aware of a lot of 
the issues that they deal with. I'm, I'm by no means going to claim that I know everything. Because internal understanding to some degree. I, I, I'm comfortable going in. You realize that we're in the middle of a very controversial situation with our transfer station or the potential for yes, curbside. Yes, I do. And you're ready to take that deep dive even knowing that. Somebody's got to do it. Okay. So if, I, was, I was here the other night when Brendan was spewing a lot of numbers. excellent information. We're, we're going to do that it's again. It's going to be talked about again tonight. Yep. So I will entertain a motion to appoint Mr. Burnham to the DPW Commissioner Board. So moved. Second. All those in can favor. I, can I, as of. Oh, I'm sorry. Effective 818. Or 19. His, the, his meeting's the 17th. 18 will be Thursday. Oh, it's. Um, our meeting's the 17th. Oh, okay. So that'll give me a chance to write my letters up. I'll, I'll drop them all on Thursday. Sorry, yes. So amend my motion to include the date of 818. So moved. Second. All those in favor. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd love to hang around for this, but my wife's... She, she <laughs> to save. Save, shave to save. I just got a picture and half of her hair is gone. Well, she, please. She only did one side. Half of mine's gone and half of yours, yours is gone too, so. Yeah, but at least ours is on the top. It's kind of down, so. yeah, All right, down. have fun at the event, Wes. We're sorry we couldn't be there. It's all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so... Easy, do you want to go back to the top and do your... Yep, so the, the first uh, item has to do with the um, restoration of the site next door where the old police and fire station was. Um, as you know, the uh, new building for the display of the antique fire pumper is in place. We'll have an electrician come in put some power outlets and some interior lighting in that, and, and that uh, apparatus will be rolled in there, you know, probably within the next couple of months. And that green cabinet that you can see from the street, that was only placed because the plan was to have the restoration job done, but the building was in the fall, and the building was supposed to come in the spring, so we needed a point of termination. We really didn't want to go in reworking that because it would have involved additional change orders. But we have found from a local electrician that that cabinet can be removed and the components that are within it and upon it can be relocated into and onto the building on one end. So that unsightliness can be eliminated and will be. Um, so this comes down to uh, the contractor indicating that their site subcontractor experienced additional costs associated with uh, the grades of the sidewalk, additional, what their claim is, is additional material involved um, and some things that they had to do to accommodate that weren't as per plan. So the final change order request is for about $6,600. But that was reviewed recently by our team, by our project manager and our architectural firm, and they indicated that with respect to materials, namely concrete, there should be about a thousand dollar credit to the town and not the other way around. So that would actually swing the number by about $2,000. Uh, in addition, um, there, are, there are other items in there that our team feels should be uh, reduced. It's going to take at least one more conference call with our team on there and the contractor and this subcontractor on there it's relatively short money, but we want to be very sure of any justification. So my recommendation would be to authorize the chairman to be able to sign uh, a f author to, to agree to any final change order number um, outside of a meeting, much as we did with respect to the seawall and the closeout of that project. So I will entertain a motion to allow the chair to sign a, or to entertain a final change order outside of a meeting. So moved. So. Uh, with respect to the grass, um, where do we stand? The grass, um, it's required that they water it, but it's also required that it comes in with, you know, adequate coverage, not weeds, real grass. And if that fails because of the schedule that they set this up on, they'll be redoing the grass in, in the fall. What's our leverage for that happening? Keeping the bond in place. We're probably lucky. 
did delay it because if they'd put it in in the spring, they'd all be dead by now. Nobody else would have been watered. Well, they, yeah, but they would have required to been required to water it. It has to live for a year, I believe. Oh, yeah. So, so I'll second the motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, next, we're, we were just talking about this, the uh, solid waste and recycling services. So I went back uh, after the last meeting as promised and took a look at slicing up the numbers that we were given. Now realize what we were given from that one particular vendor, which is one of one of, of seven that we reached out to, no one else gave us a proposal, um, that that was their um, general idea of what it would cost. But th these numbers are negotiable. If you took the numbers at face value, there's a couple of ways to look at it. Um, one way would be to leave the DPW's budget for recycling and, and curbside exactly where it is, uh, and some of that is already offset by the transfer station sticker fees. And another way would be to say, we're going to make sure that the entire amount of money that the DPW spends uh, outside of what this contractor would charge us would also be covered by the new per bag fee. The issue with that is that that uh, per bag fee gets pretty large pretty quickly if you try to um, capture all of the costs, which would be the contractor's cost and the town regular fixed costs all under the same fee. Um, for instance, we would be at a cost if, it was going, if we were looking just at a transfer station uh, and not curbside, uh, with all of the known co town costs in, in addition to the contractor's costs, uh, that's going to be a cost of about $9.30 a year, and that would escalate uh, after the first half year to nine sixty six, and then ab about $10. Uh, and fully correct, and that is based on a 5% escalation clause that we should negotiate down with the contractor, and a 2%, which is roughly what we actually would see, for town costs. If you did that same thing with respect to curbside, which has a higher starting cost, albeit a lower cost um, for continuing town costs, about 49,000, you know, you're ranging from $11.40 to $12.50 over the next two and a half years. If you look at it and you just say, look, the budget is the budget and that's covered by um, by the town, and you just looked at offsetting the contractor's costs um, through the per bag fee for um, the transfer station option. You're looking at six dollars and two cents up to six dollars and sixty cents a bag through the time period of the co of the contract, and if you're looking at um, curbside. It's like ten dollars and seventy six cents up to almost twelve, eleven dollars and eighty two cents. Yeah, there's a lot less town costs. Right. Curbside. Right. And so, you know, again, those are draft numbers and we would we would strive to negotiate, but whatever front you negotiate on, those are the relative um, numbers. Madam Chair, you had a question? I'm just wondering if it makes more sense to be having this discussion jointly with the DPW commissioners. And particularly after the new commissioner is in place, because there's only two right now. Right. Yep. So I wonder if we shouldn't, after the 18th, get him this information, have him reviewed it as well, and then do a joint meeting. I think that you know, they should be part of this conversation. And that could be the first meeting in September? It could be. I... Is that late? Let's, yeah, let's well, we're getting later and later. That would be my concern. Right. I may be able to call in for the next meeting, but okay. have Peter chair that meeting. You could do it. Because um, I would stay on mute, but well, I could. Would Wes be on it then? What's the date of that? He would. It would be the, 22nd. Be the 22nd, so it would work. In, 
in these numbers, BZ, one of the things that I do, it doesn't look like we explored, not that I need to give you more work, but I'm just curious if with the transfer station, one of the things that we've been discussing at length is having an outside company run the transfer station. But now that we're looking at that and the numbers are so steep, I know that we need to do hauling and such, but would it be more cost effective at this point to entertain the possibility of another employee instead of doing outsourcing? Uh, part, and then get a quote for just just hauling, just hauling and disposal. Disposal of yeah, we could we could absolutely talk to them about that in between meetings. Um, you could look at an additional employee. Just realize that even in a, with an additional employee, there might be times when we don't have somebody to cover a particular transfer station day, and if that happens, your yeah, policing the hopper. bags going into the hopper really falls apart. So did you, uh, in this assessment of uh, town component, did we look at three days? It's still looking at three days, and the contractor indicated that they're absolutely open to a two-day option. Yeah. Um, they would make that work. So you could, you could go to a town employee. You could go two days with, with the contractor. And of course, on every particular number, you can negotiate and say, well, you know, that's not going to work. We need to get down to some more reasonable number on a particular thing. For example, I believe they were up at 135 per ton for disposal of solid waste. Well, if I went directly to Covanta today, I could probably get in there for between 95 and $100. Okay, so there's a mark up there. And we'll say to them, well, you, yeah, okay, you're, you're still going to make something because you're brokering the deal. But a $35 swing? I, I don't know. So that's just an example of yeah. when we do sit at a table with someone. The numbers change. And yeah. Going to change for the better. Yeah, exactly. And it sounds like from a policing standpoint, it makes more sense to go with an outside company. I think so because I think we'll be stuck with the same old problem. Well, two people called in sick, and now we don't know what's going in the hopper. Okay. What you're getting for, uh, and, and I should, right, and I'll also say, this is all based upon people buying one bag per household. And you need to set it that way at first. And I think that the vote at town meeting should be a cost per bag not to exceed X. But that the Board of Public Works, as they see the months go by, can start reducing the cost of a bag if there are more bags being purchased. Okay. And so it might fix itself, but that high number here is based on the worst case scenario. Is there anything that we're missing here where, I mean, clearly the transfer station is cheaper than curbside. Is there anything missing that could make those the other way around? I'm told by more than one person in the business, even people that didn't want to uh, bid on this job, they said, no, you're never going to make curbside be any better because with the transfer station, we're doing our own waste collection. There's no labor involved with collection. The other way around, they're paying someone to go to your house and collect it. Yeah. And there's no way around that, is what I'm told. And so it's certainly cheaper. I mean, I've heard primarily, overwhelmingly primarily, that people want and love their transfer station. Um, that, you know, that I think, I don't know, should we have that as a direction going into the meeting with the BT? DPW, just leave it wide open. Is there, does, is there any sense that there's a contingent in the town that for, for whatever reason, uh, for the ease of access and whatnot, prefers the, the, um, there's certainly people that curbside. I mean, I think I'm hearing it from both sides. I think that there's definitely going to be a group of people that would prefer curbside. Usually, you know, probably our older community that can't get to the dump or they're not driving or it's more difficult. But I think from the, the consensus I've had, people want the transfer station. Um, and we do, there is private pickup available to people that can't get to the transfer station. I don't know. I mean... People want the transfer station and it's cheaper. And it's cheaper. I mean, I it's, just hard, it it's a hard it's argument to make. If we just move forward with at least that decision. Yeah. And I think it would be... That the transfer station is staying, and we're ruling out curbside. Right. Okay, so... I feel that way. Peter, how do you feel? I feel the same way. It's, okay. it's cheaper, and 
I think the majority of the people want that. And I think, as I just said, I think it would be a hard argument for us to make to spend something, spend more money for something that people don't want. You know? So in between meetings, it doesn't sound like we're going to go with an extra town employee, but I could have them give us the cost of the two-day option so that when you sit next, yeah. next time. And, and their, their feeling, especially Mike's, as to what two days versus three days means to them as a, you know, and, and he added, what, what's the downside the two days right. versus three days? And then at, the, at this meeting, this joint meeting, if you can come to the consensus that, okay, we're two days or we're three days and we're definitely transfer and not curbside, then we set up a negotiating team, one selectman, one Board of Public Works member, the DPW superintendent and myself, and we sit with the vendor and we say, okay, we're gonna, we want to work with you. We want to hammer something out, but here are our concerns. For instance, the tipping fee is, is overinflated. What can you do for us? And go down each point and see where we can get this thing to go. And remember, if you do this, it's for two and a half years, we don't have, you know, we have to have an option for public sanitation come January 1st. If you don't like what you're seeing in the two and a half years, okay, so you paid X amount for, for that, each person paying their per bag fee, but you actually have time during that whole time period to research other options or other vendors. Exactly. And maybe other vendors would be more interested in coming in after they know that we've already fixed our transfer station, purchased our new equipment, you know, gee, it's only two and a half years now, old now. I might play ball on this next, on this next discussion. Right now, I think a lot of people are not jumping in on it because they're a little bit, what are we walking into? Yeah. What are if you've guys? got one that's willing to do it, if it costs you maybe a little bit more because of the uncertainty, because uncertainty usually costs money, um, now you at least you have continuity for sanitation, you modernize the transfer station, and then you, that next go around, you see if you can get a people. Couple, big nuts out of the way. Exactly. You've done your capital. We're not saying, well, uh, you know, at the fall town meeting, we're going to go for new equipment. Well, to a vendor, they're like, what if that doesn't get approved? What, what are you going to be making us work with? Yeah. The next time around, if we get everything squared away, we're going to be like, yeah, we have everything that you need. So, you know, will you give us a quote? And we won't be asking about curbside, probably. We'll be asking about, will you give us a quote on our improved transfer station? Yeah. And I think it makes sense to ask about a two-day cost versus yep, And I'll get that. I mean, if Definitely. the residents may not like that as well, that when we went from four to three, they didn't like it. But if they want to keep the transfer station and it's more cost effective, we may just have to do that. So, yep. so we'll get that information. It's, right. OK. And can we ask the DPW for a joint meeting on the 22nd? Yes, we'll do that. Okay. And next, uh, fall town meeting. Here we go. We're already at it. <laughs> so, you know, this per first pass through when I put the list in front of the board is usually really high level review. And I usually ask whether if you looked over the list, you know, since, since late last week and you have anything earth-shattering to say about it you know we talk about those kind of big issues and then I bring it up at the next meeting and we get into more detail I had no questions I mean we, we know how this moves forward yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think as the, the meetings unfold we'll have more to add or subtract so I'll, I'll bring it back we know you will yes I'll be back <laughs> And finally, in my report, the Alewife Brook Stream Study Final Report. Although we did give our commentary to um, Interfluve after the board met last time, they have not produced, uh, they have not taken that input yet and produced the final document. So I think I'll bring that back at a future meeting. Okay, perfect. They accepted all comments. Yeah, they, they didn't say they had any issue with them. It's how they worked them into the different parts. Yeah. I will entertain a motion to approve the weekly warrant in the amount of $131,987.01. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 
I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes for the Selectmen's July 25th, 2022 open meeting. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I will entertain a motion to vote to ratify the chairman's signature on the police professional liability insurance renewal application. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to ratify the chairman's signature on the public officials liability insurance renewal application. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I will entertain a motion to vote to ratify the chairman's signature on the schedule of coverages, special property coverage. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to vote to ratify the chairman's signature on the schedule of locations. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We received, um, we have an agenda item to consider candidates to fill the tenancy vacancy on the Essex Housing Authority from M. Jane Murphy and Karen Ferreira. So we all received an email yep. with a little kind of blurb of interest from M. Jane Murphy. I didn't receive anything from Karen Ferreira. Brendan, um, there's only one seat to fill, correct? There's only one seat. So, I mean, I guess the, the person that seems the most interested to me is the person that wrote something. Yeah, and she lives there. And she correct. lives there. Yeah. So I think she has a, a Yeah, they both working. live there because it's, it's a tenant representative, oh, this particular tenant. seat. Yeah, so the person who took the time. Show, to took the time and showed the interest. So yeah. I will entertain a motion to um, appoint M. Jane Murphy to the tenant seat left at the board, um, sorry, at the Essex Housing. Essex Housing Authority. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We received a request to place a memorial bench at Kanoma Point. So I'm going to read this for the people that have joined us. The agenda item is to consider a request to change, I'm sorry, consider a request to place a new memorial bench at Kanoma Point. I'm writing on behalf of my family. We would like the Board of Selectmen to consider allowing us to install a park bench at Kanoma Point in memory of Nancy Brattel Gallant, wife, daughter, sister, mother, grandmother, and friend. The bench would be a, like the bench pictured below. Nancy grew up on Kanoma Point, as did her children and now her grandchildren. She met her husband at Kanoma Point. We are requesting permission to purchase and install the park bench adjacent to the anchor area overlooking Lowe's Gully, Mooringfield G. Please reference photo below. Our family has moored their boats in Lowe's Gully, Mooringfield G, for over 45 years. This location is ideal for the bench as the backdrop will be overlooking the location of many family memories and the spot for our community members to enjoy a breathtaking sunset. If you knew Nancy, you knew that she was all about family and bringing friends and others together, and we can't think of a better place to remember her. I know personally I recall being on the boat or taking a walk at Konomo and her looking in that direction and referencing Red Sky at Night, Sailor's Delight. And this means that tomorrow will be a beautiful day. To Nancy, it meant she was once again would be able to bring her circle together in a place she loved. We will use Mark Haskell, a local mason and a family friend, to help with the installation of the bench. We are hopeful to move forward with this project this summer as the first anniversary of her passing is approaching. And we want many of her friends and family to be able to share in those amazing sunsets that she enjoyed on so many evenings with her family and her circle of friends. We look forward to working with you and thank you in advance for your consideration. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the Gallant family. Um, and so we did receive a picture showing what the bench would look like in the location where they were hoping to place it. Why are they working with a mason? Uh, it will be on a cement pad, oh. so it will be dug, the pad will be poured, and it will be actually bolted to the pad. Right, so, this we so weeds, does, yeah. weeds don't grow underneath it. Yeah. Any? Is it the style of the other, there's another bench or two, right? Well, okay, the benches that are out at the small park are a different type of bench, but the benches that are along the waterfront are all similar to what's in the picture. And I've already heard that um, they're trying to work with Mike Galley to determine where he sources this type of bench. Okay, that, that's what I'm after, to make sure they're consistent. I, I think we actually make that our motion, that if we, if we are in favor of this, that we would require that it be consistent with the other benches. Okay. So, it, see, I mean, any further discussion? Okay. Um, so I will t entertain a motion to approve the request to place a memorial park bench in the name of 
uh, Nancy Bertel Gallant at Canoma Point overlooking Lowe's Gully Mooring Field G consistent with the benches that already exist. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I will entertain a motion to approve the commercial shellfish permit for James Fitzgerald. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Reminders, we do not have a new date and time for the Great Marsh Brewery ribbon cutting, so we will get back to you with that. The ABCC's remote public hearing will be held tomorrow, Tuesday, August 9th at 3 p.m., and that is for Phoenicia Corporation DBA Schooners Market. Pam has forwarded us the email with all of the um, connect in information and you must have the Microsoft Teams platform to do so. So if you don't have it and you'd like to join, make sure you download that because it does take a few minutes. The next regular selectmen's meeting will take place Monday, August 22nd at 6 p.m. Um, actually third floor conference room. The next Essex division meeting with the Greater Cape Ann Chamber of Commerce will be Wednesday, August 24th at 8 a.m. at Rivers Bend. Guy, I think you said you would be in attendance there. I may try. You may try. Um, depending on how I feel, I may be able to attend. The Essex Police Department Annual Classic Car Show will be Sunday, September 11th from 1 to 4 p.m. at the Town Hall Municipal Lot in Ballfield on Martin Street. The Smithsonian, Smithsonian Ex Exhibition Lunch and Reception is scheduled for Friday, September 23rd from 11.30 to 1, and you must RSVP, and we did receive an email with the RSVP information if anyone wants to join. So having no further business before us this evening, it is now the time when I am happy to take public comment. Is there anybody on the line with us this evening that would like to speak? Okay. Hearing no public comment, I will entertain a motion at 7.32 p.m. to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.